Kia ora. Um, so I'm happy to introduce Adrian Kingston. Um, he is going to be, be presenting more than just a website, changing the way Te Papa makes digital products. Um, he is the Digital Collection Senior Analyst here at Te Papa, and previously he's worked across sec the sector, both nationally and internationally. Um, Adrian, and I have to say your bio on the app totally downplays the important work that you do here. Um, but central to his work is um, making digital collections accessible and useful. Ta-da! As soon as you have internet access. Um, I can probably start. Um, you're going to be extremely disappointed if you saw the last presentation. Mine is nothing like that at all. I have no pretty pictures, no nothing. Um, and mine's not even about a product, it's about process. Um, so, yeah, I'm Adrian Kingston. I, I'm currently um, Digital Operations Lead at Te Papa. Um, I've been seconded into a slightly different role looking at operations um, across the organisation for digital. Um, and one of those things is ways of working. So that's what I'll be concentrating on in a second. Um, if you have seen me present at all before, you will know that I usually have way too many slides with way too many words on it. Thank you. Um, and I have that again. Um, <laughs> so I will be going very quickly, um, but really I think what you hopefully will be of more interest is actually the end. Um, and if we've got time, and I'll try and go fast enough so that we have time, um, be more in the Q&A that might be of value. If I just start. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, so it's not technical or anything along those lines, so we've kind of done that. So we, um, we made a new website a little while ago, uh, our corporate website, um, but the way I saw it was actually two projects in one. One was making a new website, um, and one was demonstrating to the organisation new ways of working. Um, and I very much saw them as, as almost equal. Um, I'm not going to talk about the website, I'm just going to talk about demonstrating new ways of working. But I'm going to start by talking about the website. Um, so, uh, the last redesign of the, uh, the corporate website, the main tapapa.govt.nz, um, was a responsive redesign in 2012. It didn't touch the infrastructure at all, um, it didn't look at content, which it really should have. Um, because it had grown over quite a long time. Uh, but in 2015, we had a burning platform. Um, so we had to do something. Um, and there was a little bit of a lull in digital activity in between restructures and various other things like that. And we had some staff changes and vacancies. So it was a bit of an opportunity to focus on something a bit bigger. Um, so we had to replace aging infrastructure, migrate siloed mini sites, all of that kind of thing that you, know, you should do when you're looking at um, a new site. But as I say, I wanted to demonstrate new ways of working. So um, Agile was something that was entirely new. Um, we wanted the project to be very user focused. Our previous um, main website redesigns had not been. They'd been very much brand driven. Um, we wanted to demonstrate the use of personas. We wanted to check our voice and tone to see what people actually thought um, we should sound like. Um, we wanted to have accessibility as a priority. Um, transparent and data driven decision making and open where possible. So these were all kind of new things um, for a digital development uh, at Papa. So um, Agile was a big thing um, that we wanted to try. It was the first project at Papa that hadn't been done before um, and it was at the team's request. We wanted to run Agile um, even though we are an extremely waterfall organisation. Um, we had to run in Waterfall and Agile because we still needed to report up, we still needed to meet a lot of the things that we, you know, an, an organisation has to. So we were running both at the same time. There was definitely distrust um, of Agile because it was, you know, a little bit of a dirty word. Um, and we had to make sure that our reporting and governance was in line with what the rest of the organisation was doing as well. There was a lot of misunderstanding about minimum viable product and I'll talk about that. And we had very limited experience with Agile. Um, and Agile and Government is difficult as well. Um, there's been a lot of talk about Agile and Government in Wellington over the last two or three years, um, so we're certainly not the first to try it. 
Um, but there are lots of things that get in the way, one of the big ones being procurement. Um, when we went out to tender um, through GETS, the government, government electronic tendering system, um, you have to fill in this huge, you know, multi-page, it's like 60 pages or something, um, with what you want. We didn't know what we wanted, and we didn't want to know until we'd done the research. Um, but you can't work like that in GETS. So we tried as hard as we could. Um, we had feedback from some vendors saying that it was um, a schizophrenic tender request. Um, and some people backed out, that some people didn't res respond because they couldn't understand it. Um, there was also, we have not been agile at all before, and so people didn't believe us when we said that we wanted to be. Um, so that was, that was hard, you know, we, our hands were tied, we had to do this because we're a government agency, um, but we were, you know, it's not what vendors were wanting to do and it wasn't what we wanted to do. Um, and we had waterfall finances, you know, we had to pitch up front for the whole life of the, of the project and that was not something that um, was actually good for us, um, but it's the way we had to do it. So we learned a lot, um, we've talked a little bit with other agencies and the government is trying it out and there have been some progress. Um, the way that I've worked in the past is actually running um, business teams as agile, um, not just technical projects, and I've found it to be really good. So we ran our team um, as, so the project team right from the beginning, before procurement, um, as Scrum Band. So we had fortnightly sprints, we had daily stand-ups, we had sprint planning de demos and retrospectives. Um, we had a Trello board that was open to the entire organisation. I don't think many people looked at it. Um, but <laughs> it was us being transparent and um, the fact that everybody could look at it meant that we were very careful about what we did. In a good way, we weren't hiding anything because we knew we couldn't. Um, we would have liked to have had a physical board for more visibility because we were trying to promote new ways of working. Um, but space in this building is at a premium. Um, we did manage to get a project room for a lot of the time. We wanted to project information radiators of what we were actually working on. Um, and we did a little bit of it, I'll show you in a second. Um, and then once our technical partner was on board, Catalyst, um, we ran a parallel technical sprint board as well um, because they were used to working in Agile and we used their tools, but we kept our, our project um, and our sort of business um, scrum band running at the same time. So, you know, the thing about um, Kanban or, or scrum boards is, you know, it's about transparency of work. Um, we managed our team sprints we actively managed risk and resolved problems on the board, which was actually something that um, parts of the organisation were uncomfortable with. Uh, rather than having a separate re risk register, which you never look at, um, we had it visible. And again, it was a big part about the transparency of the work that we were doing. Um, if we could see a risk, if it was in the business, it had to go on the board. And that might mean that the person who was at risk could see themselves on the board. But um, we, found, we found ways of making it work and we found it was much more actual, um, we got through risks, we saw them coming earlier and we, um, we fixed them faster. Um, we managed our pace and our rhythm and velocity, something that Waterfall does not do well. Um, we helped each other, we removed blockages, we tracked progress. Um, we evolved it as we learnt because we were very new to it. Um, and I think it was actually one of the most successful things that, that um, we did as part of the second part of the project. It's a Trello board, there's not a lot to see, um, but this was it uh, fairly early on, I think about Sprint 11 by the looks of it, um, and we evolved how we used it. It's not that exciting to look at, but um, it was extremely important to us. Um, this is me writing stories um, So for the, for the Sprint board. So one of the things that we did was we wrote blogs about everything we did, and, and of course as you do when you work in a museum is you try to use the collection to illustrate your blogs. Um, so there was a team of six of us. We were essentially self-forming because of the situation that I was talking about before. Um, we all had varied experience um, in digital or with web or with um, agile and those sorts of things, but we were all audience facing and primarily digital people. Um, so from web publishing and digital collections, we all had a shared common goal um, because we were self-forming and that was extremely important. Um, we did have some agreed roles. I was a scrum master and also kind of a search lead. We had a product owner, um, which was important. We had a tech and design lead. We had a traditional PM, um, project manager, which generally always gets upset about when I say that. 
Um, she was essentially, we needed a traditional PM on the um, project because we're a waterfall organisation and there were some things that needed to be done by, in a traditional fashion. However, she did not act like a traditional PM at all. She did what she needed to do, everything else was agile and contributing to the team. Um, and we had content and IA, IA leads as well. So all the people were T-shaped. We all worked together across the team. We all mucked in when needed. Um, and that meant that we were building up our skills and everything as well, and everyone was on the same page. There wasn't somebody going off doing something, coming back and updating the team. Um, we agreed principles and we agreed team rules, which we found was really useful. Um, and retrospectives became extremely important because this was a very visible and a little bit stressful uh, project because it's our main corporate website. So it gave us the opportunity every two weeks to nut through any problems that we needed to and figure out the way forward and keep all of our team productive and the morale high. Um, we talked a bit about information radiators, you know, that's, that's, you know, using stickies and stuff is nothing new necessarily to a lot of people, um, but actually making sure that everyone can see them, uh, the rest of the organisation as well, is something that was new to, um, to Papa. So the fact that we worked on digital principles before we started designing anything was new again. Um, we had a team charter, which we stuck to, generally, um, and we tried to project all of this to the rest of the organisation as well. So, you know, our team charter and the principles, we spread around the building. Um, we put the principles on GitHub, um, and we made sure that we could be held accountable to the things that we said we'd, we would be doing. Um, so we had to have governance and of course there's lots of stakeholders across the organisation for a project like this. Um, we had very traditional governance to start with um, and I'm sure nobody would be too offended if they hear me say that it was heavy, inefficient and difficult to align reporting. Um, we, did, we found a balance over time. Um, there was again, um, there was the occasional hippo, who knows what a hippo is? the um, highest paid person's opinion. Um, and the idea of obviously a, a team that's, that's doing things based on a data and evidence and experience um, and is a very flat structure in the, in the project team, um, hippos can really throw things off, but that happens with governance sometimes. Um, it was rare, but we had a couple of occasions. We generally had mandate and trust though um, to be able to work in the way that we needed to. Um, but there are difficult decisions. Uh, there always is for something like this, but they're not necessarily that hard, although some are. Um, we use data and evidence as much as possible, particularly for conversations that we knew we were going to have that were going to be problematic with parts of the organisation. Um, that's the things that we needed to communicate. Um, but there were some processes, some difficulties that slowed down process. Um, again, that's, that's just working in a waterfall organisation with traditional um, governance and things like that. We did better than, you know, than we would have if we were just purely waterfall. Um, occasionally we fell back to hierarchy rather than data or user need. They, those were painful times but we just had to push through them. Um, and this was us again using stats to justify why we were doing things and very much being user focused rather than uh, business focused or um, looking for imaginary goals. Uh, again, about data, 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 so we pushed this a lot. Um, we did need to build trust internally, so tapapa.govt.nz is our main digital face. Um, everybody wants a say, um, and it's fair enough because it's really important. Everybody thinks they own it, which is actually much harder um, and not practical. So again, we fell back on data and we fell back on the users. And you can't argue with winning with our users, and so that was you know, what most of our arguments were about. Um, users first, not individual business units, therefore we're not competing against each other. Um, but we did start with a huge amount of stakeholder consultation before we even um, went to procurement or anything. So everybody was able to have their say. Um, we needed to know what Te Papa's expectation was. And we needed to focus. Um, this sounds kind of obvious, um, but Agile for forces focus. Um, and because it means, it shows that you can't do everything and you don't try to. Um, we needed to deliver the things that would deliver the most value to our users first rather than some of the superfluous things that we might have done thinking they were reported if we didn't test them or anything like that. 
Approximately 70% of the visitors came to the main site to plan a visit. That was the data that we had going into this, and that was the way that we had to decide our focus. That's our biggest audience group of the website at that time. We couldn't do everything, so that's where we focused. Um, it meant that we said that we focused on a particular set of users, and we will come back to the other stuff because this is not a project, this is a product. So once we launch it, that's not the end. There will be a phase two and a phase three. So we will come back to it, and we keep telling people we will come back to it. This is really important because we had to keep pushing this. Um, we can't do everything. So all of this needed a huge amount of communication. Um, and it was much bigger than we thought it might be. Um, but it was so important that we did it anyway. Um, we wanted to bring the organisation with us. Um, we wanted to talk about process. There's no way that we were going to change the way that Te Papa works with some of these things just by doing it ourselves and then not telling anybody. So we did a lot of sharing. Um, we had an internal blog that had reasonably good readership. Uh, we did all the staff updates in person. We did individual business group meetings, one-on-ones, etc. We didn't have a dedicated comms role. Um, there's I think that's actually okay because we spread the load across the team. Everybody could talk about the things they were working on or how they were finding it, but it was a lot of work. Um, and the trailer board was part of it as well. So we started right at the beginning, um, again using collection items, um, talking about the fact that we were going to try and do this differently right at the beginning. Um, and of course user focus is a big thing. So. Um, it, as I said, it's our first real attempt at making a site that was for our users, and it is hard, it takes a lot of work. Um, we needed to ask the right questions, we needed to advocate for the users. Um, internally, you, you know, that sounds weird, but you actually have to do it. Uh, we used personas, which were great for focus and communication, and those personas were not made up. They were based on real data, real visitors. Um, and. So because of that 70% of the um, visitors being, um, the traffic to the site where it's about visiting, that's where our personas leaned as well. Um, if we were doing another part of the site, we would change our personas. Um, so as part of our transparency again, we put all our personas in GitHub. Um, anyone can see them. Um, they will evolve over time, or we will have different sets. Um, but again, we were making sure that we were being held accountable for the work that we were doing, um, and that we weren't just saying these things for the sake of it. So uh, there, uh, there is a link um, to the GitHub repository on there, which is a little bit hard to see, but so have a look at them later. Um, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about them, but they were there and they were real and we used them. They were plastered around the wall as well, so that we were always going, I don't think Wendy would like that. Um, okay, so user testing. This was, again, another really big thing for us. We tested over 1,800 people. Um, online, on floor, in cafes, um, most of them were really quick and this was the six of us. We didn't have a big team of people. Um, we had some that were up to an hour. Uh, we, we, by doing the testing, we learned a lot about obviously what we needed to know, but also we learned a, a lot that we could reuse later for other projects because there was so much information that the visitors wanted to give us. We did all the um, user testing you would expect. Um, but including accessibility things, so like closed tests for um, understanding of, of complex sentences and making sure that everybody can actually access the, the words that we're using. Um, we did automating accessibility testing as well. We did lots of interviews. One of the good things about being here is we have no shortage of people to talk to. Um, 1.8 million people through the door last year. Uh, so we just rocked on out and we asked people. And it's, we're in a very privileged position where people want to help us. Um, it did mean that we had to sometimes prompt them to be a little bit harder on us. And they'd be going, no, no, the site's fine. And we're like, no, it's not. Tell us what's wrong with it. Um, but, um, yeah, and, and it can be scary, but it's, it's, um, it's obviously, as we all know, incredibly useful, um, valuable. Sometimes the testing went well and sometimes it didn't. Um, but that's okay. That's kind of what testing is. And we told everybody about the failures as well. Um, when we did our first um, sort of real user testing, the, the, um, the user journey based and task based testing sitting down with someone, um, we failed horribly in a couple of areas that we had designed. That's all right, we learnt it much earlier than, than launch. Um, so we talked about that and we talked about the idea of that being a really good thing. Um, we told everybody about the tests that we were doing. We ran through why we did them, what the results were like. This is all part of the internal blog. 
so that again people could see that we weren't just making decisions that we thought were right, um, we were actually talking to our users. Um, content is another huge area. So we went, as I said before, the content had grown organically over a number of years. Um, we had 4,000 pages for a corporate website. This is not collections online or the exhibition sites or anything like that. It's just purely a corporate website. Um, so we got it down to 350 with a huge amount of work. Um, people were very protective of their content. It got in there uh, for some reason because somebody thought it was useful at some time. So we had a number of questions that made it pretty obvious whether it was still needed. Why is it there? Is it being used? You know, analytics don't lie. Um, if a page hasn't been accessed in six months, it's probably not needed. Um, is the content still accurate? A lot of it was out of date. There were staff members who were dead, um, who were still on the site with contact details. Um, and so the numbers don't lie, and everyone does want the content to look good. So with a lot of work, um, hand-holding and things like that, um, we worked with everybody who owned content, and with experts, and with outsiders, and with users. Um, we created new content, we merged content, we improved content, we enhanced content, we did all of that kind of thing. But we also, at the same time, we worked on tone, and we did a lot of user testing on tone. What do you think Papa sounds like? And what our users think is often quite different to what we think. Um, so we did work on that. And we told everybody about what we were doing. So there's more internal blogging. Um, MVP, so this was and remains contentious. Um, the idea of minimal viable product is not a well understood concept here where the goal for most things that Papa does is to put the absolute perfect final product on the floor. Um, which in terms of um, digital I still think is chasing the unicorn. Um, so we prioritise the values of, you know, we do the things that you're supposed to do when you're doing an agile digital product that has a longer lifespan than just launch. Um, we prioritise the features of most value to our users and deliver those first that's what we need for MVP. Um, so that we have the most important things delivered before we run out of time and money, which often happens with big um, sites like this. And then we push the idea of phase two or continuous improvement or however we're going to manage it. Um, having a really active backlog that we could point to, we recorded all of the features that people had asked for but weren't prioritised at the stage was super important. Um, but we still have people coming to you saying, um, I told you what I wanted 12 months ago, and it's like, yeah, that's what you wanted, but none of our users want it. Um, so it's not going to make it into MVP. Um, when will I get what I want? Does MVP mean that it won't work? No, that's not viable. Um, you're missing the V there. Um, and the idea of it having to be perfect to launch. There's the unicorn that we've been chasing. Um, so, and, and I put that in there because this is the blog about MVP and the backlog, constantly reminding people that there will be a backlog when we launch. Um, we also had to work with three external vendors um, because of the difficulties we had with the RFP process. Um, there was little belief Tapa would be agile, um, and so, but we were committed to doing this and we said to the vendors, we got them all together and we said, okay, we, we want to do this properly, we want to communicate, we want transparency, we want everybody to be uh, on a team. Um, we don't want things being handed over to another team or, or you know, us being caught in the middle or anything like that. So we're a team, we're partners, um, and clear roles and quick decisions is, made, is needed didn't always work. Um, we did have some failures, there's no doubt about it. Um, we had real problems, but we came out with some great new partners. Okay, so we had a sustainable, secure, up-to-date, accessible website with all the things that we needed to, to achieve from a technical um, perspective, get rid of our burning platforms and everything, um, so it's good. It's our main digital face and it's a new way of working. Um, we saw it as we need to treat this like we do our other large products uh, re that we release. Um, so we had a blessing. Um, and uh, our commercial at first was like, okay, uh, I don't know how to bless a website. Um, <laughs> but after figuring out that it wasn't that, it was blessing the people who had worked on it and people who were going to use it to visit and all of that sort of thing, you know, understanding it as, as essentially a digital to papa, um, it made a lot of sense. We even sang Waita, our little digital team. Um, the vendors came along and were uh, very humbled and overjoyed to be part of it. Um, and this is again the saying, digital is not an add-on, it's something really important, it's integral to what we do. And we did more communication internally again about uh, the work that we did. Uh, 1,700 people, 4,000 pages, 347. Um, and most importantly, over 10,000 Slack messages. 
Um, we had a high key period afterwards, which we hadn't planned, but Melissa Firth, who was our new Chief Digital Officer, um, she came in about halfway through um, the project and, and she said, um, you guys need uh, a high care period, which is where the team stays together. Um, we had it for three months uh, after launch for this particular thing. We retained budget and we retained um, the ability and the focus to go through, continue going through the backlog and, and priority, uh, but also to watch the metrics after launch. You know, when it's out, make changes based on the metrics that are coming in. That's, again, MVP is great. You're not going to get everything right. We do any immediate fixes we need. We had two areas that we were, we had put a lot of work into and it didn't work. We made changes. Um, you're also supposed to uh, start moving to BAU. Um, but we didn't actually have a BAU. Um, business as usual. Um, so it's like, Again, not just dropping the, the, the site and expecting someone to just kind of look after it or whatever. Have a plan for how it's going to um, evolve, be looked after, be managed um, and have continuous improvement. Again, we were going through another restructure and change of roles and we lost momentum and this was the biggest failure. Um, but, the one, and the biggest disappointment because we could actually see it happening and we couldn't stop it. Um, so not an excuse, but yeah, anyway. But we, after not long after, we did have a new dedicated content team, um, and they've done some great work since, and they've learned some things, um, and they've tried a whole lot of interesting things since. So we do have to come back to think about what's phase two, or BAU. Um, we've done some trickle development very slowly um, to keep our vendor engaged and the, the really key people that we needed because they were so good. Um, we have been trying content experiments we are starting to plan the next phase. Okay, alongside all of this has been a move to being hopefully some kind of digital to papa, setting up a digital team, um, setting up some new roles, and also a framework for developing digital products. No more projects, no more, um, you know, in anybody who's got a digital idea can start doing it and dropping it or whatever. Um, the digital product development framework is something that's going to be very important in the um, upcoming couple of years. And we had a little bit of experience working with the website project that we could feed into it. Um, the DPDF uses agile, lean, and design thinking tools. Um, all great and all quite new to Tapapa. More transparency, blah, blah, blah. And um, we're also actually looking at a working environment as well, which is something else that came out of um, the lack of um, being able to collaborate together or have spaces where we can show our work and things like that because we have an office, a back of house office that was designed in the 1990s. Um, so we're fixing that now. So what we learned, this is kind of, essentially the two slides are the most important. Um, we have a lot to learn. Um, Agile is difficult in a waterfall organisation but it can be done and it's definitely worth trying it if, you, if you're able to. Um, Strict roles, particularly the product owner and the scrum master, are hard to do without mandate. Really, really hard to do. Um, so it takes a lot of effort. Retrospectives are extremely important um, because you need to look after your team health, particularly for long and um, very visible projects. Uh, Lo-fi testing is amazing. Um, and the more you can do, the better, and the more you can do in the team rather than farming it out, even better. Build the skills in-house. Um, and it is possible to run Agile into Papa, it's just difficult. Um, communication and transparency with your organisation, not just the noisy stakeholders. For these kinds of things, it's really important that everybody understands what it is, um, why we're doing it, and that everybody feels that proud when it's released. Um, handover or staff continuity is vital um, because that gives you the momentum that we lacked. Uh, take your learnings on to the next project, of course, please. Um, and create the new normal from all the things that you've learned. Because this is all we were trying to do. Um, these new ways of working are not about trying to be trendy. Um, you know, when, people, when you say agile, people think, oh, they're just trying to you know, be like Google or, or trade me or whatever. Um, we wanted to make sure that we were building the right thing for the right people in the right way, um, not wasting resources and looking after our working culture, which is extremely important, and our working health. That's it. Um, does anyone have any questions? We've got one minute, apparently. <laughs> anybody, anybody? 
Hi, you said that um, people who might be obstacles ended up with their name on the board where everyone could see it. How did you deal with that? Um, it was we didn't put their name on. Um, we we put what the problem was, um, you know, and and it, that idea of being forced to um, write down what the risk is in a in a objective way, or you know, without getting personal or mean or anything like that, was actually really useful um, because it then tied us down to what is the problem, not not who's the person who's annoying us or anything like that. So it was actually really useful. Cool.